on this episode of Life in a Tide Pool. Find out what these animals are, why they choose to live on their heads, and why governments around the world spend billions of dollars annually trying to control and manage them. Welcome everyone. On today's show, we're gonna talk about one of the most common seafaring animals known to man. This animal can be found in all of the world's oceans and has been a problem to boat owners and operators ever since the first sailors took to the ocean thousands of years ago. This animal can be found in all of the world's oceans, most of the seas, wherever there's a hard substrate to attach to. The animal we're talking about is the barnacle, very much like the ones we have right down here. Ever since humans began sailing the oceans, barnacles and other fouling organisms have attached themselves to the bottom of seagoing vessels. When fouling organisms attach to ships, they will slow the ships down by adding additional drag. Ships have to use more fuel to overcome this increased drag. It is estimated that barnacles and other fouling organisms cost the shipping companies about $1 billion a year in extra fuel costs. Barnacles not only cause shipping companies to spend more money on fuel, they also have to spend billions of dollars a year removing the barnacles from the bottom of their ships. One of my favorite places to study barnacles is Crystal Cove State Park. Crystal Cove State Park is located in Orange County and provides visitors a great opportunity to explore amazing tide pools, beaches, and experience many other habitats. There are several great tide pool locations in Crystal Cove State Park. The tide pool area that we are going to explore is between Reef Point and Rocky Bite. Barnacles, as we learned, can attach to almost any hard surface. Take, for example, this piece of driftwood here. If you take a closer look, you'll notice there's actually a couple barnacles who've attached to this piece of driftwood. So you look at this and you might ask yourself, well, how did these animals get here? How did these barnacles get to this piece of wood? Why did they choose to live on this piece of wood, not one of those nicer rocks back over here? Are these barnacles dead? Are they still alive? To answer some of these questions, I invited a colleague of mine to come help us explore the tide pools and teach us a little bit more about the ecology of barnacles. So this is Danielle Zacharel, and she is a professor of biology at Cal State Fullerton. Danielle, thank you so much for helping us out today. I want to go explore these tide pools. You ready to go? Absolutely. Okay, let's go. All right. I happen to be looking at this rock. It's a rock that I pass by all the time when I'm jogging here down at the beach in the mornings. And I'm always fascinated by it. It's just covered with these barnacles. There's more than one kind of barnacle here, I think. So Danielle, what types of barnacles do I see here? So you're seeing the buckshot barnacle, the famulus, up high here. And if you move a little bit lower down, um, we see... Right, some of the little bigger ones Yeah, down here. the larger barnacles are balanus, and um, those are um, often called acorn barnacles. And it's interesting, the two barnacle species overlap to a certain extent, but the um, famulus barnacles are able to survive higher up in the intertidal because they can um, handle much more uh, drying out stress, desiccation stress than the balanus barnacles can. So they're probably exposed to air a good... Oh, many hours a day. Many, many, many hours a day. So they're, are they holding their breath or what are they doing during this time? They are definitely lowering their metabolism. Okay. They're not feeding, so they're in a resting state. And they have um, an operculum, um, two plates that actually can close and retain moisture inside of them. So desiccation's gotta be a very, very critical abiotic factor for these animals, right? Absolutely. You notice that there aren't a lot of uh, fleshy animals or yeah. algae living up this high in the intertidal zone. There are, in fact, only a handful of animals that can survive up here. Um, the, these famulus barnacles being one of them, and then these others, even higher up, you might notice these periwinkle snails. Yes, they're very tiny, though. Yeah, they really are, yeah. So they're probably feeding on some of the microalgae, I would assume, something up here like that, possibly, maybe. Yeah, what's so interesting about those, um, though, they're living in an area of the intertidal called the splash zone. So they can expect to be moistened by ocean spray, but they will never be submerged. Really? So it's just basically spat? Yes. So when the water splashes on them, they all of a sudden <gasps> feed, 
and then come back in. Well, for the barnacles, yes, that's right. Right. Well, actually, the barnacles are living in the upper inner tidal. It's the, the periwinkle the snails, the snails that are living up in the splash zone. That's Very right. good. Yeah. Our next location we stopped at was closer to the ocean and a bit lower in the tidal zone. So, Danielle, I'm about to walk over in this rock over here, and I'm now seeing mussels. Okay. So, mussels are probably live a little bit lower. They do. They live time. in what's known as the uh, the middle intertidal zone. So, where we were with the barnacles, that is what we consider the upper intertidal, and now we're sort of entering into the middle intertidal. Okay. So, the middle intertidal, more water, less exposure to air, and a wider variety of organisms that you're going to find. Okay. What about competition? So, this is probably a better place to live. Animals want to live here a lot of contention, right? There is, there's a lot of competition for space. But you know, it's interesting you say a lot of animals want to live here. There's actually one little advantage to living in the upper inner tidal, and that is that you don't need to worry about predators too much, at least marine predators. Very good. Whereas if you live in the mid inner tidal, then you are um, subject to predation pressure by some of the most ferocious inner tidal organisms, including uh, the sea star, Pisaster, Ocratius. Right. So this is a nice big pool of water here, and so this pool of water sustains a lot of different marine life than what I see on these exposed rocky areas. So why is that? Because these tide pools retain their water throughout the entire low tide period, um, it is uh, an easier life uh, in terms of the abiotic factors. So in terms of the physical factors that they're experiencing, they're not getting as crazy a swing in temperature stress or desiccation stress, so drying out stress. And so for that reason, we see a lot of inhabitants in the tide pools. You mentioned abiotic factors. Abiotic factors are non-biological factors, as you said, like heat, uh, wave action, That's right. drying out, desiccation, things like that, right? Mm -hmm. And biotic factors are more biological, predation. What other type of biological factors do we have? So there's predation, there's competition. We spoke right. about that earlier when we discussed the fact that, um, that in the middle intertidal, there's this fierce competition for space. Uh, and, and actually the two barnacles we talked about earlier, the balanus barnacle and the thamelus barnacle, they have a fierce competition for space. And they're another one where you can sort of view a war front where <laughs> the, the thamelus stops existing and the balanus um, starts dominating. Um, those balanus barnacles, those larger barnacles, are able to overgrow the smaller thamelus and they're also able to undercut them and actually push them off the rocks. Right. Yeah. So as I was walking across, okay, there's some on the rock over here. I'm gonna walk a little bit over here. So this is another sure. kind of barnacle I'm looking at right here, right? That's right. These guys right here. Yes. So what are those? Those are called volcano barnacles, Fissurella vol volcano. And you'll notice they have this beautiful pink hue or pink, sort of pink reddish hue. Right. Um, they're just another barnacle species, but they live uh, you know, in the mid to lower intertidal as opposed to the balanus and thamelus that can exist higher up in the intertidal. So far, we have found three of the five common types of barnacles. We started looking for the fourth kind of barnacle that happens to be named after a bird. Okay. So I'm looking for something, and I'm looking for gooseneck barnacles. Oh, yeah, right. And I want to see if I can find some. Yes. To be, oh, there is some in the back right over here. Do you see some? Right up in the top right here. Here's another, like right here, here's a big clump. Yes, have gooseneck and here's a great here. clump here too. All right. Wonderful. So this is the fourth kind of barnacle we have seen here today. So yes, we had the is. two ones and the volcanoes over here and stuff like that. This. I have to look, lives in a different area than all the rest of these barnacles. So why does this live one here, this goosenecks live here? You know, um, I think that they, well, one thing is that they like to aggregate together. They like to um, live in a cluster, and that's so that when they're reproducing, they are going to experience better reproductive success. They're not going to have to go as far to find a mate. But um, as far as why they live down lower, they're not able to survive as much desiccation stress, so drying out stress, as those other barnacles we discussed. And um, so they're going to be living lower in and among the mussel zone. Um, and among the mussels can be a much cooler environment because the mussels are, are physically shading them and also retaining moisture. How do they get their name? It is a funny name, isn't it? Well, so it was believed back in the 1500s in England that barnacle geese were actually birthed from these barnacles. Uh, barnacle geese are really common in England and every summer they would disappear and they were actually migrating northward to breed in the Arctic but um, what began to appear in the summertime were pieces of driftwood with these barnacles growing from them and they looked so much like the, bar the, the barnacle geese, the shape of the head, that um, it was believed that this was actually the youngest life stage and that these would open up and give birth to these baby geese that would then swim and fly away 
That's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. So the other misconception a lot of people have, and I have too when I was younger, is these are these are crustaceans. They're more related to crabs than they are related to these mussels and clams, right? That's right. Now they're they're heavily modified um, in terms of their features, but just like um, uh, crabs and lobster, they have uh, paired jointed appendages and an exoskeleton. But they live um, encased in these plates that they produce, and they actually live upside down. There's a cement gland at their antennae that cements them to um, to the hard substrate, to the rock. So they're literally living on their heads right now. They are literally they're living on, their, on heads. their heads, and their feet are actually what is, is the appendages that they use to collect the, the food from the water. That's correct. Yeah, they're modified uh, legs that are um, modified. They're called cirri, and they uh, or cirri, and they beat. Right. Um, so these are filter feeders. They are. They're filter feeding when the tide is high and they're submerged in water. Yeah, and so obviously the, the tide water will be above over here until enough water and the water covers them up, then they put the feet out and start feeding at that point. Right. That's okay. Correct. So what are the, some of the main predators of a barnacle? You know, barnacles have to worry about um, both predatory whelks. So these are snails that actually can drill a hole in their plates and feed on them. Huh. Um, okay. They have a specialized uh, tongue-like organ called a radula that is able to pierce through the plates. And in fact, uh, actually on the, on the one I'm looking at right now, it looks like we can see the beginnings of one of those little drill holes. Someone trying to drill in there. That's right. They also have to worry about sea stars. Like sea stars are um, a really um, common predator of uh, gooseneck barnacles, and all barnacles for that matter. You may have noticed that these gooseneck barnacles seem to live in very specific locations. They don't seem to live very high in the tide zone. They don't seem to live very low in the tide zone. They also seem to prefer certain sides of rocks. More barnacles on this side yeah, over there. Yeah, beautiful tetraclita. So here's an interesting observation. Why would I see the barnacles on this side rather than maybe somewhere else? You know, it probably has to do with exposure to the sun. The conditions on this side, they may experience less direct solar stress being located on this side, it's also possible that it has a, it's a hydrodynamic thing, that it's the way right. the water flows and that this is a great um, little surge channel where they're going to be right. picking up a lot of extra food so that's going to be surging through. So the water's moving a lot faster, it a is. lot more food, it's I can have a bigger animal. Food. That's right. Very good. Yeah. So Daniel, another question I have about these barnacles is here. So I, I know that once they make the decision to live here, it's a pretty important decision, isn't it? It's the most important decision of their life. I, in Southern California, we can all appreciate when you um, purchase a plot of land, it's, the, it's a very important real estate decision. And for them, it's the only one they get to make. Once they're cemented down to their habitat, they've chosen that, that home for life. So if they've chosen a bad location, they're Gonzo. done. Juvenile barnacles use specialized appendages to taste the surface of rocks to determine if the location is a good place to settle down. To learn more about how barnacles make this fascinating decision, I went to visit Danielle in the lab. Right, so we th they actually undergo what's known as a metamorphosis, so a complete body change. We think that they're using chemical cues that are released by their conspecifics or individuals of the same species that is cueing them to understand that this might be a good place to live because others of my kind are living here. Once they settle onto the substrate, they can actually use tactile senses or touch tens senses and chemosensory tens senses to um, explore that habitat a little bit, make the decision to settle down and then cement themselves actually to the to the hard substrate. The other thing we learned about these particular animals, we saw a lot of them clumping a lot, and that's actually getting the signal from the other animals living in that area. This may be a good spot. Right, right they're gregarious settlers, that's right. Gregarious, uh, very much like the aggregating anemone we saw in the sandcastle worm. Is that similar? Yeah, well, the sandcastle worms, absolutely. They're, um, the aggregating anemones, actually, that may have been the result of one settlement event, that, right. and that individual anemone then cloned itself over yeah, and over again to form, to form that aggregate. The tide pool habitat is a very special place. It's packed with marine animals that are easy to see. It provides a window into an unknown world. Exploring the wonders of a tide pool, however, is generally reserved for those of us that live near the coast. So how can people that live far away from the coast have the opportunity to learn and enjoy tide pools? So I'm standing at the beach right now, right next to this educator. The educator is part of a program that the state of California and Crystal Cove State Park puts on. So to tell us more about this program, I've actually invited Jennifer here to tell us more about the program. Jennifer, tell us about the PORTS program. I'd be happy to. So the PORTS program is a free distance learning program 
created by California State Parks to connect K through 12 schools to our park system. So who has access, who can sign up to, to participate in this program? Technically speaking, anybody can sign up for the ports program. So long as the school has a basic connection uh, to the high speed network and a video conference unit, they, all they have to do is sign up. So the ports program allows people in landlocked who's never seen the ocean before, way in the middle of the country, to experience and learn about the marine environment. My absolute favorite group to work with are those that are landlocked and don't actually experience this environment because it's very exciting for them. Uh, yes, so that is definitely a demographic that enjoys this program for sure. So you have kids that have never seen the beach, that this is the first time, maybe the only time, they're actually going to experience the ocean and, and the ecology. That's absolutely correct, and you'd be surprised, not even 20 miles inland, there are kids I talk to that don't experience this environment, so yeah. Okay. This is kind of some of the equipment we use to actually run the porch program. Can you tell us maybe just a little of this information? This right. So we have different ways of uh, delivering the content of our program here on the uh, educator, as we call this vehicle. Um, I have a document camera, a laptop, the video conference camera itself. We have a monitor as well, so I can see the, the kids in their classroom and various uh, specimens that we use uh, as we're delivering the program right. as well. So you literally... I also have an underwater camera. <laughs> great. So great. live video footage from inside a tide pool uh, as, as well. That's amazing. You actually take this, drive it to the beach location, and right on the beach, you do the broadcast. That's right. I'm literally right by the rocks at the tide pools delivering these programs live. Wow. So I also understand you're other part of the educational uh, functions here at the park. So what other educational opportunities does the park provide? Right. Outside of the ports program, we, we provide several other uh, interpretive programs as well. We have junior ranger programs. We have field trips set up for kids um, from local school districts that come to experience our park. Uh, we also have junior lifeguards that we do interpretive programs for as well, um, and a whole host of other uh, summer programs that we do. Well, this is actually a fascinating, wonderful, wonderful program. I wish you the best of luck in it. Thank you. Tide pools are very sensitive habitats and even a small change can have a dramatic impact. I asked park naturalist Winter Bonin to share with us how visitors can enjoy and explore tide pools more responsibly. Before visitors go explore the tide pools, what are the rules and regulations a visitor must understand before we go actually to the tide pools? Visitors need to understand that this is a very fragile ecosystem. This area where the land meets the sea is one of the toughest environments in the world. So we ask people to please leave everything here. It's a state park. Don't take any rocks, shells, animals. All you can take is the sand in your shoes and the memories that you made. If you want to touch an animal, we ask them to please be very gentle. Use one finger and touch it inside the pool and understand that all these animals are struggling to survive and they all have special adaptations so please be very gentle with them. We ask people not to turn over rocks. There are a lot of little organisms that live underneath the rocks and rely on the coolness or the moisture and if we turn them over, forget to turn them back, they dry out in the sun. And finally, we tell them to have a great time. No visit to Crystal Cove State Park would be complete without a visit to the historic district. So we're going to go meet Park Superintendent Todd Lewis who is going to show us around a bit. So Todd, about how many cottages do we, we have at the park today? Within the 12.3 acre historic district, we have 46 historic cottages. So each cottage has, you know, has a name and a number and lots of history. Can you tell us a little bit more about that type of history about the cottages? Yeah, that's right. So that's one of the neat little quirks that gives us a little extra personality. Every cottage uh, is numbered, and that was a historic numbering system according to when those cottages were sort of connected into the grid. Right. And then secondarily, they're named according to either their historic or their adaptive reuse purpose. Ah. So this cottage standing behind me, what is this cottage functions and purpose here? This is Cottage 46, also known as the Rotating Exhibit Cottage. And so exhibits meaning like exhibits about the park, natural history, things like that? Correct, or art, um, any, anything that's relevant to our purpose here in the historic district. Very good. Tell us a little bit more about the, the rental cottages here. Well, out of our 46 buildings, 29 have been his, uh, restored. Out of the 29 restored buildings, 16 are available as public rentals and there are a total of 24 overnight rental opportunities in those 16 buildings. So opportunities ranging from single family cottages to dorm rooms. Specifically, what are these cottages right behind me? Tell me a little more about these ones here. So these cottages are single family or 
uh, entire unit cottages. They're not broken up into uh, dorms inside. So when you rent one of these cottages, you get the whole thing. Uh, in some cases, that includes uh, a nice backyard, side yard, or front porch. And uh, the, the place is yours for the duration of your stay. Right. So when did the cottages actually become online to be available for rent? I know there's a big process to, to refurbish them, get them ready to rent. Tell me about that process and when they came online. Sure, the cottages came online. The first phase of restoration came online in 2006, and that includes all the cottages behind us right now. Okay. In 2011, we finished the second phase of restoration, which was an additional seven cottages, and yet to go is the final or third phase of restoration, which is the last 17. When is that scheduled to come online, the last 17? What's that schedule look like right now? Well, we're working with our partners, the Crystal Cove Alliance, okay. on the funding needs for that project. And they will be the ones uh, that will be spearheading right. and, uh, and moving the phase three program forward. Right. So Todd, I noticed these cottages behind me here, and they're not rental cottages, but they have some other function here. So what, are, what is this area? function as? Well, the area as a whole is known as the Education Commons, okay. and the cottages are known as our CARE Studios, that's C-A-R-E, Community Art Recreation Education. And it is representative of what living in that cottage would have been like. It's, it's furnished and it's uh, an opportunity for people to walk through and get a, get a feeling for Cove life. Uh, the cottage in the middle right behind you is Cottage 43, okay. and that has a timeline of some history at the Cove. And then um, next to that cottage is 42B, and that cottage has some historic bathing suit displays. There are five main types of barnacles commonly found in California. We had the chance to see four of the five today. We saw the tiny little buckshot barnacle, we saw the little bit bigger acorn barnacle, and we saw the red, pinkish, red thatched or volcano barnacle, and of course we saw the gooseneck barnacles. The fifth type of barnacle, which we didn't have a chance to see today, is called megabalanus. Megabalanus is a little bit larger barnacle, kind of reddish, and visitors to the tide pool have a chance to see them after large storms because what happens, they'll attach themselves to the mussels. Mussels break off, wash up on shore or in the tide pools, and you can see them attached at that point. I went to visit my friend Mike Schatt at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium to look at some of their barnacles exhibits and see if we actually can see some of the barnacles feeding underwater. Mike, I'm interested to learn more about these barnacles, and I notice you've got a whole tank of what seems barnacles over there. Tell us a little bit more about these barnacles. This particular tank is uh, all about animals that make their own houses, if you will, house builders. And in this particular case, we're talking about barnacles. So every once in a while, you can see what looks like these rakes that come out, like that one that almost came out then, and will rake through the water looking for food. Um, if you look over to the side here, hopefully you can see what looks like a almost like a jelly-like structure, but it also looks like a rake. Well, that is the molt of that barnacle's insides. So the barnacle itself, inside of its shell that it has made, uh, in order for the shell to get bigger, it builds onto the shell. But in order for the animal to get bigger, it molts, just like a lobster or a crab. So if I understand you correctly, you know, the barnacles have a hard outer shell, right? And that kind of grows slowly. So the inside of the animal, just like a crab or lobster, has a shell too, and it has to kind of break that shell and grow that shell inside of its hard outer cover. That's that exactly right. And then it discards the left, the what's left, and we call that a molt. Okay, so it's the same molt that we would see like a lobster molt or the crab molt. Exactly. Ah. And as, pers as a person that gets a lot of questions about what people find in the ocean, especially um, those that have uh, uh, plankton nets or something, Barnacle molts are one of the most common things that people don't understand what that is. And some, once you've seen it, like I've seen it many years ago, I know exactly what it is every single time. Really? Great. So I see these little pink finger-like projections coming out in these barnacles. So what are those? Uh, those are the feeding uh, legs. So they actually are legs. Think of a barnacle as a, uh, like a shrimp-like animal that is settled on its back and is kicking food into its mouth. So those... Uh, those kind of pink-like, rake-like structures are the feet of the barnacle kicking food into its mouth. I'm, I'm going to have to assume, though, that it's going to need a pretty good water flow over the surface to get enough food. That's right, and that's why this particular tank uh, has water flows by the aquarist that were set up specifically so that it would uh, promote feeding. 
So when we feed them, the food uh, goes directly into the tank, uh, and then it goes by the barnacles, and the barnacles take it out. That, that's amazing. So tell me a little bit more about actually how you feed a barnacle. Well, well we feed them uh, plankton, but we raise the plankton here at the uh, aquarium. So we use uh, baby brine shrimp. Uh, people know them as sea monkeys. We raise them every single day so that people can, uh, or so that the animals can have live food for them. So how do you feed this particular tank? Uh, we take out water that has a lot of the baby brine shrimp with them, and we have turkey basters, and we'll suck up a bunch of the water with the babies, and then put it directly into the tank.